for coming. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm so happy to be reading in a yoga studio. I love yoga, and I, I think about a lot of poems when I'm doing yoga. I know you're supposed to like clear your mind and be in the present and all, but if I don't think about poetry, then I'll just think about pizza or something. So. Um, <laughs> and I've got a yoga poem, so I'm going to start with that. The people say, black girls don't do yoga, so we'll call this a stretch of her impossible imagination. Another way her brain eludes the limits of her brown body's available shapes. Where is the anger in her breath when her exhale mends the fractured frame preserving the mold of her clay? How can she sigh so light, inhale and bend while her sisters and brothers divide from their own silhouettes, rays shining behind them but never illuminating their chests? Who does she think she is? The people say that ohm shit's for white folks. Hear them say she trying to pretend she don't have problems, and maybe she is. Thought she, though she can't forget the weight of chains linking shackles to her wrist, she remembers her muscles moving to crease the curses stuck to her history book's covers. No, black girls don't do yoga, and black girls don't breathe deep. Too shallow is the air she dives into at birth. Too frantic the footsteps she's grown to follow. <clears throat> she cannot exist in the pause of the present, with existence spinning on the endless need for escape. Easier to picture her stillness as an accident. Call her limbs sprawled to see the outer circles of her reach, her lungs infused with the life force of CPR. Must we also see that the only breath come to save her on this flat brown plateau? flows from deep within lungs all her own. Thank you. So that's one of a few poems that I'm working on about things that black girls supposedly don't do, but that I've encountered or had experience with. Um, so I'll read another one. The people say black girls don't have eating disorders. So we'll call this her issue with food. The way she waits for the closed fist of hunger to clench under her ribs. That empty mess, her body's punishment whipping her from inside. Food becomes a trespasser on the tongue. Her belly's yearning will yield the reward of looking a little more like skin on skeletal remains. Such a look wouldn't be natural, but isn't she unnatural in so many ways? The people say she's trying to be a white girl, but she never will be. Hear them say she's trying to be cute, but she never will be. No, black girls don't diet and black girls don't have eating disorders. And she's beginning to wonder, too, if black girls aren't called beautiful. If the best she'll hear is cute for a black girl. And if so, what good is she? She'll soon lose track of this discipline's aim, wandering through the wanting without a comp compass to recall where the searching began or where it will end, or what she's searching for. Does she hope for certain digits on the scale, or for the emptiness, just the company of the emptiness itself? So um, I'm in my last semester of my MFA program, which means that I'm putting together my thesis right now. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you know what that's like. For me, it's kind of like um, giving birth and having contractions for like six months straight. Um, <laughs> just kidding. It's not, not quite that painful, but almost. Um, so I, I don't know why I said that other than to vent. And <laughs> now I'll read this next poem called This Is Not About Birth Control. <laughs> A white man has my uterus. Perhaps I should be more clear. My uterus is inside the body of a man, a man who works as a US senator, so I suppose my uterus now spends most of her time behind the beige buttons of a suit sitting in a big white building. I don't know how she got there. I know she's not resting comfortably. Part of her flesh weaves between the senator's ribs and another stretches around his kidneys as she tries to fit in with his organs. He knows she's there, of course. At first, he tried to pretend she wasn't. He told his wife it was indigestion that had him lurching about all night, and when his young son caught him wrapping his arms around his belly, he shivered and said he was cold. Soon he learned to boast about her. He saw his secretary swallowing my doll and said, hey, I got one of them uteruses too and you don't see me complaining. 
As she already knew, each day he leaned against the back of his office door, his body bubbling with pain. On a fishing trip, his good old boy snickered about the gripes of women. He joined in, saying, they don't even have it that bad, you know. I've got a uterus now, and I'll tell you, it's more of a comfort than anything, more than anything I've ever known. The other men watched the tears polish his eyes. They didn't ask him to fish again. <laughs> Though he was boastful, he stayed away from the media. Rumors of the senator with the uterus seeped into the tabloids, and he began to cover his torso with a black sheet when he encountered the glaring lights of photojournalists. This is a private matter, he'd say to them. He tried to say the same to me when I asked for my uterus, so I had to remind him that a matter of my uterus is a matter of mine. He was impossible to reach at first. I tried calling, and the secretary sighed when she relayed the words, leave your uterus with me. You weren't taking care of her anyway. Insulted, I wrote letters. Tried to insult him right back, but they all appeared in my mailbox with notes. Returned to sender and tell her to leave me alone. Emptier each day, I resorted to protesting outside his office. Other women were there, calling for the ends of wars and for adequate health care and all. I held up only one handwritten sign. It said, I just want my uterus back. Once the senator agreed to return her when I threatened to take my story to Oprah Winfrey. Instead, I received a video from his wife. It shows the senator on his mahogany floor. He's curled up, eyes closed, like a newborn kitten. He's clutching his stomach, mewling, saying, don't make me send her away. His wife and two small children stand in the background. She covers their son's eyes, but lets their daughter watch. Won't you please let him keep her, she asked in a letter. He's gotten so attached, and I don't know what he'll do without your uterus. Last I heard from the senator, he planned to give me what's mine. I don't need your stinking uterus, he said on the phone, sniffling. You'll get it in a few days. Twenty-eight days have gone by, and I still don't have my uterus. The senator's phone is disconnected. News reports say he's resigned. I don't sleep at night. I hold the hole at my center and wait. a couple more. Um, this next one comes from my experience as a nerd. Um, <laughs> and actually that makes me a black nerd, which actually isn't all that unusual, but some people are really fascinated by it, so I get to pretend it makes me special. Um, <laughs> so this is called Black Nerd Love. The night lulls by before your thigh sweeps mine. From books in our laps to be spectacled eyes. We have to put down the W.E.B. Du Bois. Your double consciousness knowledge turns me on. When your fingers lift the veil from my skin, you taste all my sides and drink me all in. And if you could see you from inside my eyes, you'd see just one bold consciousness rise. We've got to know this is black nerd love, and this love anchors me to thoughts of what bell hooks wrote about wholeness. No single part of me does your kiss miss. Slide books aside and don't wonder why I love literature. Moan without comparing our sounds to white vernacular. The only questions you ask about my hair whisper through your fingers as you tug with sweet care. When I'm loving you, I rock my own truth. Don't wonder if my punk funk ki tunes kill the mood. To this moment in time we both came from afar, found there's no one right mold for who we are. So we touch as naturally as our hair grows in locks, release ourselves from tight belts and striped socks. I welcome you like a black character in my dearest comic. Let you thrum through me for my uses of the erotic. Our shadows stream shapes of black nerd love. With bodies entwined, we both rise above the self-hate growing on that racial mountain for respect we learn from Aretha Franklin and passion we learn from Klingons. Some folks wonder what planet we've landed on, but we know this earth was made for our loving. Seeds from Africa grew to bloom our special something. And this is about more than dark skin and glasses, and it's deeper than the handprint shapes on our asses. And it's not just having sex or having something in common, or explaining our identities without any problems. How many of us are here inside this room? I mean, there's the self inside me and the one others see too. But with you, I don't struggle to know where I stand. This is black nerd love, and all four of your eyes can see who I am. So I'm just going to read 
one more. Um, so it's not February anymore, which makes me sad. Um, do y'all know what February is? What's special? What? Yeah, there's Black History Month, there's that. Um, <laughs> but it's also, did you know, it's also sit next to a black person month. Do you know about this? <laughs> so we actually have the founder in the room tonight, Juan Booth, founded sit next to a black person month. <laughs> addressing this very pressing issue that we all face, which is the fact that when you're on public transportation, no matter how crowded it is, it can be completely packed, and the one empty seat is the one next to the black person. And so this was, this was invented to address that, um, and I wrote this poem inspired by it. It's called Bus Seats. Let's be real. If we start out as strangers seated side by side on this bus, we may end up as enemies. Who knows what might happen if the two of us share one bubble in this shaking soda can? You might reveal yourself to me one sunflower seed at a time, your overflow of snacks and spit leaping dangerously close to my side of the white plastic hump that divides us. Or maybe you'll be weary enough to fall asleep, your head hovering above my shoulder like a bird circling her kill, threatening to drop right down into my personal space the moment you drop from consciousness. Or you'll pick up the phone. Lean away from the rest of the passengers as if to shield them from the dreary details of your life, but talk directly into my ear. I'll have enough information to recommend that you take a vacation and stop speaking to your mother, but I'll keep my mouth shut. You might even dare to speak to me. Take it upon yourself to disrupt the scratch of my pen on this page, to ask me what I'm writing, ask me where I'm from. You might even ask if you can touch my hair, and you know there's no turning back once you've gone there. But today, we won't get the chance to ride together through the strangeness of strangers. Today, I must look to you like some kind of thug. Me, carrying only my gentle breath beneath loose jeans and a baggy black sweatshirt. I saw your light eyes scan the landscape here at the crowded corners, the family smashed together to share one seat. I saw your eyes stop on the cold plastic beside me and stay there for one whole minute before you planted your feet in the dark, sticky soil of the bus's floor deciding to stand rather than sit beside me. So go on, stand. Enjoy the ride as you sway with every turn and stumble with every shudder, and I breathe a little bigger and stretch out over the seat you'll never claim as yours. Now, perhaps, we won't share sunflower seeds or spit or sleep or unwelcome speech. Maybe we'll have no real reason to be enemies. But your standing feet divide us by something we haven't yet faced, and maybe we'll never have the chance to give it a name. Thank you.